We have Boston, Staten Island. Cool. I'm here in New Jersey. Vermont. Woohoo. So what's nice about these classes is you get to cook in your own kitchen and I'm in my own kitchen. So now you have dinner ready to go when you're done. So I see a couple people have you just popped in. Hi, hi, Helen. Um, I was just mentioning if you wanna drop in the chat where you're tuning in from, that'd be great. I know there's some people in class already who have taken classes with me before, but if there's any newbies, let me know. And during class, if you wanna keep your camera on, off, doesn't matter, whatever you feel most comfortable with. So like I mentioned, try to get out all your ingredients. If you are cooking along today, I will be going along with you and cooking with you. So we're gonna go at a nice slow pace. I promise I won't go too fast. Um, so make sure your salmon's out. You have all your different ingredients. I have mine separated for the salmon burgers. And then on the side, I have everything ready for the sauce. So if you did not do that yet, you can start working on that. So again, thanks for tuning in. This is the first class of the Virtual Teaching Kitchen. I am very excited about this new series. So I am a registered dietitian and a chef. My name is Julie, by the way. And I have a business, Chef Julie RD. Can't see me in the full screen. Let me see if I can fix that. It's a one woman show over here. So I'm trying to read comments as we're going. Hopefully as we grow, I can get someone to help me with that in the future. Let's see here. So right now on the screen, you should be seeing on the left hand side, you should be seeing me. On the right hand side, you should see me seeing my cutting board. And then also the list of ingredients on the side and a little banner at the top of the bottom. If you need the screen bigger, you can just blow up your Zoom. I have it pinned, so you should be seeing that. And you wanna go to speaker mode if you can't see it big in the screen. Got it, cool. Okay, so again, welcome. This is the Virtual Teaching Kitchen. I've done cooking classes in the past. Um, I kind of revamped my style of how I will be presenting these recipes and teaching these classes, I wanna make sure we have some nutrition education tying in. So it's not just a recipe, it's not just cooking, we're gonna learn as well. So the flow of the class is that we will do a little bit of a presentation and our topic today is seafood for heart health. And every class will have a different topic that goes along with the recipe. So if there are any topics that you really wanna learn about, let me know, email me, drop it in the chat, because then we can cater these classes to what you guys want to learn about. So if you wouldn't mind for the beginning, I want to keep everyone muted. If you have questions, drop them in the chat. Again, we're going to do the presentation piece first. Drop your questions in as we're going and I'll circle back to them as we are cooking along. So today's class is going to be presentation, then cooking. Some other classes, it might be reversed depending on what we're cooking. So for instance, next class in October, we're doing a soup and that's gonna have to sit on in the pot for a little while. So we're gonna do cooking and then the presentation for the next class. So again, thank you for joining in. And for future, if even if you cannot make a class, still register. Each class is being recorded and after class, you're going to get the replay. So again, these classes are not just how to make a recipe. I'm not just handing you a recipe, showing you the steps, and that's it. We're going to learn some culinary tips along the way and some nutrition tips. All righty, so let's get started. So I started talking to you a little bit about the virtual teaching kitchen. So my goal of this is to provide free virtual cooking classes with that nutrition education, making it accessible for all. 
I have really big plans for Virtual Teaching Kitchen, and I hope to continue to grow, and I'm very excited about this. So if you are on social media, definitely follow at Virtual Teaching Kitchen on Instagram. Or also, if you want to show off what you made, even if it's during class, after class, weeks after class that you've made it, make sure you use the hashtag made with VTK so I can see it and give you a round of applause for your good work. All right, so today's class, our topic is seafood for heart health. So we're going to talk specifically seafood today. Heart health is a very big, broad topic. So throughout our class and our series, I'll break it down into different topics in regards to heart health. So today's all about seafood since we are making salmon burger, burgers with lemon dill horseradish sauce. So heart disease is described as a range of conditions that affect your heart. Most likely we know someone who is affected by heart disease. It might be ourselves. It might be a family member, friends. It could be in our genetics. So on average, one in four people die from heart disease annually in the United States. But the World Health Organization estimates that 75% of deaths can be prevented by lifestyle management. And what are we talking when we say lifestyle management? That's diet, exercise, stress, sleep. Um, all of these play a role. Of course, in our classes, we're mainly going to be focusing on the diet aspect and cooking and creating those behavior changes to help with promoting, again, this topic, heart health. So yes, can diet play a role? The American Heart Association notes that coronary heart disease is 90% preventable with proper diet and exercise. And who says up to 80% of cases of coronary heart disease, 90% of type 2 diabetes cases, and one third of cancers can be avoided by changing to a healthier diet, increasing physical activity, and stop smoking. So those are huge numbers by just switching what your diet is to make these choices to prevent heart disease. So let's talk a little bit about numbers. Hopefully everyone is getting their yearly blood work done. If you don't, this is my little, little plug here to go to your doctor, get your annual blood work done. Having numbers and having that hard data is a great starting point. So as you see here, there's good, borderline, high, or low. And you're looking at your different kinds of cholesterol. You have your HDL, your LDL, and your total cholesterol. And then you're also your triglycerides. So quiz time, HDL, is that your good or your bad cholesterol? Drop it in the chat if you know. That is your good cholesterol, ding, ding, ding. If you wanna remember it, think H healthy or H happy, it's your happy cholesterol. And L, think L lousy, it's your bad cholesterol. So again, your HDL plus LDL equals your total cholesterol and we're aiming for less than 200. So having your blood work done every year, even if you're within that range, it's good to have that hard data because you can kind of see things, how they trend. Are you starting, starting to trend up closer to 200 every year? That's not a good sign because once we hit that 200, we're probably most likely going to get into the borderline or even potentially high. So we definitely want to make sure we're checking in and wanting to fall into those ranges. Now, genetics does play a piece of the puzzle in the role of heart disease and cholesterol. But if you wanna dig a little deeper within your blood work and your LDL is high, you wanna see how dangerous your LDL cholesterol is. The particle size does matter. And you can see how dense your particle size is in your lab work. It will say LDL density. And if you, are having trouble understanding it or viewing it, ask your doctor. But when we're looking at that, genetics does play a role and someone might be always leaning towards the higher side of that 200 or higher side of the LDLs. 
but we can look a little deeper and see how dangerous their particle size is. So if you have big fluffy particle cells, what's happening if you kind of look at the picture, those blood, those cells are just kind of going through and kind of bouncing off the walls of your arteries. Whereas the smaller ones, they're a little bit more dangerous. So what happens is they're kind of nicking and cutting or getting embedded into the artery wall, causing that plaque and buildup. And that's what's most dangerous when it comes to high cholesterol. We have, we don't want those narrowing of the arteries. So something to consider if you would like to dive a little deeper into your cholesterol numbers. So quiz time, what foods contribute to high or low cholesterol or what's contributing to that cholesterol number in your diet? What kinds of foods? Anyone, anyone? Processed foods, yes, definitely processed foods. So think about the good and the bad cholesterol. We wanna kind of focus on fats. So there are three kinds of fats. You have saturated fat, trans fat, and unsaturated fat. So each of these fats affects or impacts your cholesterol levels. So saturated fat, for example, the American um, guideline, the dietary guidelines for Americans gives you some wiggle room with some saturated fat, but you shouldn't be exceeding what the recommended value is. So saturated fat are things that are solid at room temperature. So think butter, animal products, so like the marbleization and meats. So it's not that, that you can't have them or they're all bad. We just need to look at how much we're consuming. So if oh, you have overconsumption of these saturated fats, they can raise your LDL, your bad cholesterol. They don't really do much to your HDL. They kind of leave it alone. Your trans fat, for example, that's your hydrogenated oil shortenings found in a lot of processed foods to keep them shelf stable for longer. A lot of bakery items, that kind of thing. And overconsumption of trans fat, we really shouldn't be consuming trans, trans fat if we can avoid it because they raise your LDL and actually lower your HDL, your good cholesterol. Then you have your unsaturated fats, and that consumes of your monounsaturated and your polyunsaturated. So those are foods like avocados, nuts, chia seeds, salmon, um, olive oil, and I just said that, I'm not sure. Um, but anything that is more liquid at room temperature, so like your olive oil, is going to be those healthier fats. And we don't wanna avoid fats, we wanna consume more of the healthy fats. And what happens is the unsaturated fats that help you lower your LDL and raise your HDL. They minimally raise your HDL. One of the biggest things that you can do to raise your HDL is exercise. So just a little bit about our fats. And we're going to focus on our heart healthy fats today, our unsaturated fats. Also with heart disease, we also have to think about hypertension, also known as your blood pressure. Um, having these numbers, again, hard data and looking for trends is really important. Um, but knowing that you're looking for that less than 20 over 80. And lifestyle management can help with managing blood pressure as well. All right, so let's talk seafood for heart health. Eating seafood two to three times per week reduces the risk of death from any health-related disease by 17%. Again, that's a big amount, 17% if you just include seafood two to three times per week. So I'm not saying you have to eat these salmon burgers two to three times a week. There are so many varieties of seafood. Also, we cannot eliminate the canned options as well. Those are a great affordable option to add in our seafood. You can do canned salmon, canned tuna. And I have a slide for you to kind of show you the different amounts of omega-3 fatty acids within each kind of seafood. 
So eating foods with anti-inflammatory properties like seafood can reduce inflammation in the brain and lower risk of mental illness and support heart health. So overall, those omega-3 fatty acids, those good fats found in our fish and our seafood, they're going to have anti-inflammatory properties. Anti-inflammatory properties is food that's kind of hard to describe. So if you have a cut on your arm, it's going to get inflamed. It's going to get red around it, especially if it's infected. You can visually see that. You can't really see what's going on within your body as, as in a form of inflammation. So we want to consume these anti-inflammatory foods to help combat the inflammation. And inflammation comes from everyday stressors, environment, food choices, how active we are. That can contribute to our inflammation in our bodies. And fish, we're using salmon today, is an excellent source of lean protein. It has those essential omega-3s, and it provides vitamins, minerals that are important for heart health. So let's dive more into those omega-3 fatty acids. The body cannot produce omega-3s, so it must come from your diet. If you do not get enough through food, there's always an option for supplementation, but I'm always a big proponent of food first. We should always try to get all of our nutrients through our food. So two main omega-3 fatty acids are your EPA and DHA, and they're mainly found in fish and fish oil. So as you see this chart on the slide here, it walks you through different kinds of seafood and talking through which one has the highest amount of those omega-3 fatty acids. So if you can start noticing here, also tuna, you'll see in different categories, tuna skipjack, tuna in water, tuna um, uh, from the, if you're from the fish pole line, they're all going to be different levels of fatty acids based on how they're being, how they're living, how they're harvested, et cetera. I will send this um, handout to you after class as well, so you can really see it with some more resources. All right, so that is just a little bit about how important seafood is for heart health before we dive into the cooking component. So I didn't see really any questions coming in. So did anyone have any questions yet? So again, we kind of go through the basics of the topic. And if you have any other questions throughout, definitely don't hesitate to reach out in the chat or after class if you want to reach out to me as well. All right, so let's move on to our recipe. So we are making these salmon burgers. This is one of my favorite recipes. It's so good. And this is a good recipe to transition someone who's maybe not really into salmon to try salmon potentially because it's in that burger form. So first things first, let's start with our salmon. And if again, you guys wanna put on your cameras, don't wanna put it on your cameras, totally up to you. But if you wanna show me anything through, throughout class, let me know. Let me just change the one screen on my computer. So when you're purchasing your seafood, I have the skin on this. I already skinned it. So if you did not do that yet, please skin your salmon. And I just have it in chunks right now. I am using the food processor. If you do not have a food processor, don't worry. Just so start chopping away. We just want um, to chop it down and bring it into smaller pieces. We don't want to puree it. We don't want like a salmon mousse. We still want it chunky enough but fine enough to hold together into our burger pads. So this is our beautiful salmon. I love the color of salmon. And we are going to just use our food processor here and put, putting our pieces right in. So again, if you don't have a food processor, totally cool to start chopping away right now. So if you wouldn't mind, in the chat, if you are cooking along with me, can you just kind of give me a heads up so I can kind of make sure we're staying at a pace so everyone can keep up.
All right, cool. So this is the loud part. You can mute me for a second if you want to. But before I pulse, I'm just pulsing it. Let's make sure I get this on, right? Whoop. There we go, click. I'm just pulsing it a couple times. I'm not gonna let it run completely because if you let it run, you're not gonna have as much control of how big of the pieces you want them. So just a couple pulses. So you can kind of see the consistency here. Maybe I'll bring it up to the camera to see if you guys, Ooh. can you see how it's still pretty chunky, but still getting that smooth kind of texture. So this is the perfect consistency that we're looking for. So gadgets are great, but you don't need a bunch of gadgets in your kitchen if you don't have them. So do not worry. And if any time we have a class and you need an alternative ingredient or um, don't have that piece of equipment, just shoot me an email and I can provide you some alternative options. So this salmon is going into a large bowl because we're going to mix after this. I haven't tried this recipe with canned salmon, but a couple people told me they have. You just need to make sure that if it's packed in water or olive oil, you want to press as much out as you can um, because we don't want a ton of moisture because you don't want to um, have wet patties. It's not going to stay in its form. All right, so we have our salmon. Everyone good to go? Everyone's salmon. If you're chopping, I can wait a minute and talk about our other ingredients. I'm not seeing anyone needing to do that, so I'm going to keep moving on. We have some breadcrumb. I'm using a plain breadcrumb just because we have some other strong flavors that I want to shine through, um, especially like the dill, the lemon flavor, the garlic. So I'm not going to use like an Italian flavored seasoning here. You can use a whole grain breadcrumb. You can use panko if you like a little bit more texture. That's totally fine. Recipes are just a guide. They are not a mandate. So you can feel free to mix and match different things that you like and enjoy. We have one egg. This is going to be our binding agent. So I'm just going to whisk it a little bit before I put it in. I find it just helps really make sure that you have, it's going to be evenly distributed throughout. And if you start noticing on the bottom, there's that seafood nutrition messaging throughout our um, class today. All right, so that egg is going in. Everyone on track, we're still doing great. We have a little bit of salt. So I usually always have this little container of salt um, here so I can just add a pinch and go when I need to. Why do we use salt in cooking? If you've taken a class with me before, I'm sure you know this answer because I say it all the time. So why do we use salt in cooking? Anyone, anyone? To enhance the taste, enhance the flavor, yes. So the salt is going to act as that component to bring out that lemon flavor or bring out that dill that's going to be in our burgers. Bring out that beautiful flavor of the salmon. It's not meant to make our food taste salty. And especially for heart health, we're thinking about lowering that sodium. So we do not want to add a ton of salt to our food. We're going to add our fresh flavors. But salt does play a role. So don't remove it. Just make sure you're not over-salting it. Think about a cookie recipe, for example. There's always that little pinch of salt in there. Are your cookies tasting salty? I hope not, because that means you maybe made a mistake. But it's to bring out that chocolate flavor, bring out the peanut butter flavor if you're making peanut butter cookies. So it has a role. 
So we have that salt in there. We have a little bit of garlic powder. You could use fresh garlic here if you wanted to. I just find that um, the if you don't mince it fine enough that you're losing flavor throughout, you'll have like pockets of garlic. And I love garlic. I'm not going to complain about that. But I find that that powder evenly distributes a little bit more. And using our spices and herbs to really flavor and season our food is going to be a really great way to, again, lower the sodium. We have some dill here. So I have my dill over here. I bought a bunch at the store. I rinsed it and I just filled a cup with some water and I'm putting my whole bunch of dill just sitting right in here and that's how I'm going to store it. You can put like a little mesh produce bag on top. Um, you want some air kind of going through or even a little Ziploc bag, but just make sure you're not sealing it and it's compact. This is going to help keep your herbs fresher for longer in your fridge. Another option is you can take a damp paper towel and um, roll up your herbs and kind of line them in a container in your, in your fridge. The goal is that we don't want to use only a little bit of herbs and then let them die in the back of our fridge and we end up tossing them. So this doesn't have that many knife skills. Future classes, we're going to work on some knife skills too. But when you are kind of chopping an herb like dill, I just picked up the little fronds from the stem and I'm going to bunch them up. And this is what I call the rocking motion. You want to put your hand steady on the top and you'll notice that my knife is never leaving, leaving the cutting board. I'm just going to kind of fan back and forth. So up and down. My knife is never leaving the cutting board. You just want to create that pile again. Back and forth. I love dill. I think it's so flavorful. I really love Mediterranean kind of Turkish food. So dill is a big flavor profile in that food. All right, so we have our dill. That's going in. And then we have some lemon juice. So I have half of the lemon because we're using the other half of the lemon for the sauce. So I'm just gonna squeeze that in. If you have your whole lemon, I didn't show you this because I already cut it. So, so I was dividing and getting my mise en place ready. But if you have your whole lemon, roll it on your cutting board first before you cut it. Have you ever cut into a piece of citrus like a lemon lime, even an orange, and it's very, you think there's no juice in it, you just kind of squeeze it and like nothing comes out. It's because all those little segments in here have little pockets of the juice and you're releasing the fibers to when you roll it on the cutting board and then you slice it and it's easier to pop out. All right, so this is where we get to be a little messy. I'm gonna start off with the spatula, but then I'll work on with my hands. And just give it a good stir, make sure everything is going to be incorporated. Those who are cooking with me, how are we doing? Are we all kind of all at the same stage right now? I got a thumbs up, cool. Very, it smells very flavorful already. You can even do this um, recipe. I haven't tried it, but I'm sure it will work really well too if you use like a ground chicken or um, ground turkey and you wanna kind of do the same flavor profile. All right, so this is getting all mixed together. I'm gonna get a plate of fresh gravel plate before. And what we're going to do is we are going to create and form some patties. So the recipe I believe says make six servings. So you can make divide this evenly into six, or you can decide I'm basing it kind of off the size of the buns that I have here um, to determine how kind of big and wide I'm going to make them. So 
So before I get my hands dirty, let's talk about sustainability of seafood. So I get the question a lot about farm raised versus wild caught. And I rather change the conversation more towards sustainability. How sustainable is it? Because there could be good parts and bad parts to wild caught and there could be good parts and bad parts to farm raised. So let's talk about that for a little bit. So farm raised doesn't necessarily mean that it's in a pen and the, the fish are swimming on top of each other and they're not moving. I had the amazing opportunity to go to Norway to see how their farm raised salmon is done sustainably. And right in the ocean, in the big old ocean, they have these pens that are set up. And I forget the ratio, but there was so, there was barely any fish in each pen. That's how much room they had to swim around and be in their natural habitat. It was just the parameters were kind of um, were, were circled off to make sure that no predators or nothing bad was going to happen to the salmon as they were growing. They often made sure they had enough food and resources to make sure they're growing to be at a healthy size. So that would be a very sustainable approach to um, farm raised fish or seafood. So you also have with that is they are really, um, they took a lot of care within their environment. So after they would raise some salmon in one part of the ocean, they wouldn't use that part of the ocean for I don't know how long until the ocean kind of went back to its original state or you don't wanna keep using that same site over and over and over again. So when you say wild caught, that's always great because everyone thinks that's the best option, but you could now run into overfishing and now the environment and making sure that we have the sustainable ecosystem living in our ocean. So overfishing can be a problem. Also, there's risk for contaminants in both farm and wild caught. Um, so you do what is best for you. You just have to really understand that it's not going to be one size fits all. Understanding where your seafood is coming from is really important. You can ask the seafood counter, the department, and I have a really great handout for you that really explains the different kinds of regulations that um, different seafood fishermen and retailers are taking pride in to make sure that you are getting a safe, healthy option. So that handout is coming to you after class. There's different labels to be looking for there. All right, my burger buns are a little bit small, so I might get even more than six patties. We shall see. So I'm not making them too thick. I do not want them too thick because I want them to cook evenly. This guy. Find it easier to make all your patties ahead of time instead of trying to have your hands dirty, putting them in, removing them. So again, more mise en place, meaning everything is ready to go. How are burgers coming? I see some people cooking away in their kitchens. Beautiful. How thick? Um, so, I'll kind of show you how thick I'm making mine. Hold on, let me finish this one up. Um, I mean, how much would you say that? Like quarter inch thick, half, half inch thick? Are you going to freeze some? Should you freeze them before or after you cook? Good question. You can freeze them in the frozen or in the raw state just like this. Um. What you could do is wrap them individually in plastic wrap and then in foil. And then I just kind of put them flat, freeze them. And then I'll put them in like a Ziploc bag and put them wherever they can fit in my freezer. So yeah, in the raw state, one second, let me just wash my hands real quick. Also, 
my mom has this really cool silicone burger patty kind of holder. I'll link it to you in the follow-up email as well. Um, but it kind of looks like a hexagon kind of like thing. And you can put all your patties, smush them all in there. And there's a cover and they freeze. So when you just want to go to use one, you just pop one out, thaw it, and you're ready to go. So I'll link that to you as well, because that's an easier way to, instead of individually wrapping everything, if you're interested in that. All right, so these are gonna stay here for a second and we are going to move on to our sauce. We wanna get that ready to go before we cook. I like to kind of leave these to sit for a second as I make the sauce, just because bl flavors are blending and you're setting them so they won't be falling apart as much as you are cooking. All right, moving on to our sauce. Let me get all of our ingredients out. I'm gonna get some more of our dill. All right, I am using a full fat plain Greek yogurt. If you use a full fat, it will be less tangy. So if you don't mind the tanginess, definitely you can use a low fat or a fat free if you want to. I just like how it's a lot creamier, I find, and it has a better mouth feel. Also, if you don't want to use yogurt, or yogurt at all, you can always use sour cream. I'm just looking for those heart healthy options. This is also going to add in a boost of protein. We are going to add in some um, Dijon mustard. If Dijon mustard is a little too sharp for you, you can always add less. Oh, and one more thing about our fat in our omega-3s and our yogurt, we need fat in our diet. We just want to focus on those heart-healthy fats, like those omega-3s, um, because they are fat-soluble vitamins. So vitamins A, D, E, and K are fat-soluble. So you need to consume some fat in order for your body to absorb and utilize those vitamins. All right, we need some more dill in here. So I'm going to pick off some of our dill. So something like dill, you could use the stems. Um, they're pliable enough, but not in like a sauce. If I was making more of like pesto, I would use it because they break down, will break down. Um, but the stems are very flavorful. So something like parsley or cilantro, you don't have to throw them out you can utilize them in like a pesto in the future. All right, how much dill? We should add a little extra. I'm feeling, I'm really feeling the dill today. It smells really good. Again, we're going to do that fan motion. Move this to the side. We're just breaking it down. I'm all about shortcuts in the kitchen too. So if you do not want to use fresh dill, you could always use those little squeezable options. They make these, this one brand, can't remember the name of it right now, but they make these like semi-dried herbs where they're partially dried. So they last a lot longer in your fridge and they're already chopped for you. Those are really great. You can also use dry but you would not use the same ratio. You'd use only about a third of the amount because your dry is going to be a lot more intense of that flavor. So we don't want to overkill it here. We also have our lemon. So again, I already rolled it to get all those juices out. I'm going to squeeze the juice. I'm kind of going backwards with this. Usually I would zest first, but if I zest, I'm nervous I'm going to squeeze it. Squeeze out some of the juice. So I'm just gonna add the juice first. Of course, if you have a bottle of lemon juice, you can use that too. But the reason I'm using fresh, oh, got seed in there, let me clean that up. Is because I want to use the zest. So this is a microplane. I'm actually not going to do it right over um, it because the way I like to use the microplane, you have a more sturdy approach if you put it on your cutting board instead of like doing it in the air. 
So we don't want to kind of microplane our knuckles off at all. So we're just going to do it right on the cutting board. And you want to just go just far enough, just till you get to the white part, which is called the pit. And if you go too far, it's going to be bitter. We don't want that. So the reason I wanted to use this lemon because we are using the zest today. If you want more of a lemon flavor, add zest. Because if you keep adding more lemon juice, it's just going to add more acid and become more acidic. So these natural oils coming from the rind is going to help up the flavor of our lemon, but without adding more acid. All right, I'm gonna give this a nice stir and this will be ready to go. And here, if you wanna add a little pinch of salt, you can. Again, we're bringing out those flavors. How are we doing for those cooking along? You're all kind of at this step with me. Okay, beautiful. Look how great this is. And use sauces as a vessel um, to get in more veggies. So this sauce could even be a great dunker for carrot sticks or cucumbers or peppers. Don't be afraid to use sauces to up your veggie game because I don't know about you, but after a while, plain carrots kind of gets a little boring. I want to jazz it up a little bit. All right, beautiful, beautiful. I'm gonna ship. Oh, I forgot an ingredient. Nobody told me. I forgot my horseradish. This is the whole point of this recipe. <laughs> we have our horseradish here. So we're not using a horseradish sauce. We're using just straight up horseradish. Again, if it's too much for you, you can pull back. Um, this is more than a tablespoon. I'm actually not going to use all of this. I'm just going to use about that tablespoon amount. Good thing I didn't forget that because you would have forgotten it too, probably. Ooh, that will clear out your sinuses if you take a big whiff of that horseradish. You can use fresh horseradish. I don't always see it at the grocery store. It kind of looks like a big white kind of funky looking carrot gingery knob. Um, but you could freshly grate it if you want to. Again, not always available, but if you have it, great. All right, so this is going to go on the side. If we were if we weren't using it right away, I would be putting it into the fridge, but we're gonna get cooking. Also, if you just noticed, I took off from my cutting board. We didn't do so much chopping today, but I always have a damp paper towel underneath my cutting board to prevent it from sliding. There's nothing worse than when you're cutting and things are starting to shift and move. We don't want that. So I'll put this to the side. All right, how are we doing? Is everyone at the same pace as me? All right. So today I'm using my cast iron skillet. Um, I have this induction cooktop burner, but of course I could always use my gas burner as well. It's just a little easier for you guys to see everything. So I'm going to get my pan preheated. So whenever you're cooking, you want to make sure that you're heating everything up properly. So you always want to start with a hot pan. Then we're going to add our oil. Our oil will then heat up. And then we're going to add our food. Do not add cold oil to a cold pan, turn it up, or even add your food and then turn it up. It, cooking is all about the transfer of heat. So you're heating the pan to heat the oil. The oil is going to help cook and transfer the heat to the food to cook it. So what happens is if we have a cold pan and it's heating up as it's coming to temp and your food's already in there, your food is just soaking up all that oil and it's not going to really do its job. So you're going to have bone dry pan, and you're gonna end up needing more oil. And while our olive oil is a heart healthy fat, we don't want too much of a good thing either because um, your fats are more caloric than your carbs or your protein, your macronutrients. All right, so I just kind of feel it a little bit. It's getting nice and warm. So you want to have everything ready to go. So I have an empty plate for my cook burgers. 
I have my raw burgers. I also have my fish spatula that has a piece of dill on it. But my fish spatula, if you don't have one of these, this is one of the a cheap, affordable option, and you don't just need to use it for fish. But what's great about it is it's very pliable, it's bendy, so you can really get under stuff. Oh, let me turn on my fan before I forget. So we don't get smoked out in here. I'm just going to add in our oil first. And back to our spatula. Nice. Ah. So it's really pliable and it's very thin. So it's easy to really scoop things under. So something like a fish, like a filet, if you have the skin on, it'll be really easy to get underneath. But I also like to use these for pancakes. I don't know why I'm a terrible pancake flipper, but with this, I'm a good pancake flipper. So one of my favorite kitchen little gadgets here. So if you see, you can kind of tell that it's glistening in. And you can see that's kind of pulling away the sides of, I don't know if you can see, because it's a dark pan, from the pan here. That's when you kind of know that it's ready. Number one thing, don't do. I know people promote this, but don't do it. Do not like a splash of water in there. It's just going to spit oil back at you. Don't do that. I've heard people recommend that. It's not safe. All right. So we do not want to overcrowd our pan. All right. I don't know if you can hear the sizzle with the fan on, but that's a good sign. And the sizzle is a round of applause. That means you did a good job about turning your pan on to get to that temperature. So good job there. So I'm only going to do about three at a time. I do not want to overcrowd it. And you see, I have my one dirty hand that is touching the raw fish. And then I have my one clean hand that I will use to scoop. So if you're not familiar with cooking seafood or fish, you want to cook it to the temperature of 145. So if you're not comfortable by looking at it or feeling it or doing the flakes test, especially with fish, usually it says cook until it like flakes. If you're not comfortable with that, cook to the temperature of 145. Having a good um, kitchen thermometer too is really great. And I definitely promote getting a digital one versus one of the analog ones at the little timer. It's just going to be more accurate and you're gonna get that result right away and you can prevent it from overcooking. So if you notice, I have not touched these yet. I'm letting them be, let them do their job. Especially with something like salmon, you can kind of tell when it's going to be ready to flip based on if you kind of look at the side, it's going to start coming up the side that it will take color. So once it's about a quarter of the way, it might be ready. But another way to tell is if it's ready to go. Do not keep forcing it to flip over or keep flipping it back and forth. You're not going to have that even cooking. So did everyone who's cooking along, is it in the pan? I get some nods, cool. So what would you cook along or what would you serve on the side with these burgers? There's so many options. What would you guys do? I'd maybe do a quick salad. A slaw, ooh, I like that idea, slaw. We can even add some, some of the slaw on top. Need a little crunch factor in there. I like those salads, that, those salad kits that comes with everything so you don't have to really think or chop too many things. It's just all ready to go. Just give me a little peek. Almost ready. So when I did that, I felt no resistance. That's what we're looking for. We don't want any resistance to try to force it to turn over because it's not ready. Roasted broccoli, yes. Any roasted vegetable would work well with this. You could even do like baked sweet potato fries here too if you wanted to. Cucumber tomato salad, that's been my jam lately. I've been making a lot of that. Sometimes I add chickpeas. All right, this is looking golden brown. Oh, only one side. This pan is a little hard. 
because the heat's coming right from the center. Ship these guys too. And also try to do something that would go with the sauce so I can dip the sauce in it too. Yeah, definitely. I mean, even roasted carrots, though, you can roast carrots and use those as a dip. I'm trying to think what else. Help me think of some ways that we can use the sauce as a part of the side. Again, raw veggies, that can be kind of boring after a while. All right, this one's almost ready. This one's almost ready. Smells really good in here. Does this smell good in your kitchen? Also, so I think I think it smells good because I like I love salmon. So people think after you cook fish, it has that fishy smell throughout your house. A couple of ways you can combat that. Um, after you cook, obviously you can open a window. Um, but you can also light a candle, do it all that thing. My favorite tip is to actually put on a small pot of water with a couple cinnamon sticks. It smells so good. It kind of smells like Christmas. So um, if you want to roll into the holiday season early, but it really will overpower that salmon smell and you'll your house will smell like cinnamon. I love it. You do thin the sauce and use it. Yeah, I love that idea. Thin the sauce and use it for dressing. So definitely you can thin the sauce out. I love that idea. And use it for dressing all these are perfect. Here. You can do it as like a grain bowl. Oh, what if you do leftovers too? You can even break up the burger and you can have like a grain, like farro, quinoa. You can have whatever veggies that you roasted, put that on the side, put some of the greens, like arugula or something, and drizzle that as a dressing. That could be very yummy. So our buns today, you could choose again, any bun you want, but I find that it goes pretty well with this brioche bun. Brioche has a little bit of that like kind of sweet buttery taste to it. And I'm using some butter lettuce. Some butter lettuce is a little different than your regular lettuce. It's more delicate. Oops, you can see here, it's more delicate. Um, and I just find that it adds a really nice, fresh, crisp, flavor. So I'm going to put these on the side. I'll just peel them off. And these are Gotham Greens. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of these. Gotham Greens, this brand. But um, I believe they were originated in Brooklyn. They are a hydroponic garden, meaning that this was not grown in soil, that water was still feeding it the nutrients it needs to thrive. They have some really great stuff. I think they have a pesto too that's really good. No worries if you have to leave early. Thanks for tuning in. So always remember, any time for these classes, even if you can't make it live, these are recorded. So you will get the replay after class and you can sign up and watch it later. You can cook later, you can cook with me now, doesn't matter. But again, if you do make it, I would love to see it. So you can email it to me, you can, Share it on Instagram or Facebook and use the hashtag made with BTK. And that'd be great. I'd love to see it. All right. These are about done. So just top that there. Add maybe two pieces of that lettuce. Oh, let me do the sauce first. Sauce. And then we have our lettuce. Our bread is done. So without all the talking, we probably could have easily made this recipe in much, much faster. But we had to talk about the heart health of seafood.
So I actually got seven burgers out of this. Depends again how big you want to make them. So does anyone have any questions for me? <laughs> Next time you got to cook along. So throughout this, there will be classes every month. Hopefully we can add more classes each month. That's my goal is to continue to offer these free classes. Um, again, if there's any topic or kind of recipe that you're interested in, let me know. And as we start to build this community, hopefully more things are good or will be coming along the way. I have also a new idea too, is I'm going to be build a list of registered dietitians who offer nutrition counseling. So if there's a topic that is really personal to you or you need help with after class, you have a resource to go to afterwards to get that one-on-one -on -one counseling to really help with that. Yay, they look great, thanks. So again, these are super easy. I'm gonna just finish cooking these guys off, but I'm gonna hang here if you guys have any other questions. But I just wanna say a big thank you for tuning into the first class. I really appreciate it. You will be getting a follow-up email with the video of the replay, plus some additional resources that I was talking about. And I think I'm gonna throw in another one or two seafood recipes for you in there as well. Thanks for joining again. I really appreciate it. Bye, Ellen. See you soon. Oh, so the next class is October. I can't remember the date off the top of my head, but I'll put it in the email. We are making acorn and butternut squash soup. I like to mix them because I really like to talk about all the different varieties of squashes. And there's a little secret to that recipe. It's very creamy and luscious, but there is no cream. So we're adding some secret ingredients to kind of add in there. Maybe expand your palate a little bit more. October 19th, thank you. Someone's on top of it. <laughs> so again, sign up to all the classes, even if you don't think you can make it because you'll get the recipe and all your resources plus that nutrition education piece. So thanks for tuning in. I'm actually going to sign off. But again, follow up with me if you have anything that you want to see, have questions about. I'm here to help you. And thanks for tuning in to the first class of the virtual teaching kitchen. Bye, guys.